Hello, fellow risk takers, and welcome to my worst investment ever. Stories of loss to keep you winning. In our community, we know that to win in investing, you must take risk, but to win big, you've got to reduce it. To join our community, go to myworstinvestmentever.com and receive these five free benefits. First, you get the risk reduction checklist I've created from the lessons I've learned from all my guests. Second, you get my weekly email to help you increase your investment return. Third, you get a 25% discount on all A. Stotts Academy courses. Fourth, you get access to our Facebook community to get to know guests and fellow listeners. And finally, you get my curated list of the top 10 podcast episodes. Fellow risk takers, this is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stotts from A. Stotts Academy. And I'm here with featured guests, Pat Soyao. Pat, are you ready to rock? Yeah, let's do this. All right. Well, let me introduce you to the audience. Pat Soyao is currently the managing director and founder of Icon Executive Asia, an executive solutions firm that focuses on executive search and executive events that service a roster of high profile and high net worth clientele. He's also the chief strategy officer and co-founder of Shoppertainment Live, the leading live stream shopping network in the Philippines. Also, check out his podcast, Job Defined, which is all about debunking job descriptions through interviewing actual professionals who are doing that job right now. Pat, take a minute and fill any further tidbits about your life. Okay. Uh, thanks for that intro. So again, my name is Pat. I'm, uh, I'm an entrepreneur. I started my business back in 2013. I'm on my third and fourth business, so I had my few, not really few, I had more misses than hits eventually, and um, experienced my own fair share of losses, a lot of them monetary, and I, I guess that's why I'm here. Mm -hmm. And just maybe give, give me a little idea about like what, what strengths do you have as an individual or as a company now that you've been in business for a while, you know what you can deliver. I'm just curious to understand that also so that listeners can understand potentially maybe they should hire you. Well, um, I believe my strength is business development. And I've been doing a lot of business development. It's not just, it's more than sales. It's actually a lot of things. You're more of a generalist. You, do, you know several points and that's the, be that's the beauty of it. Because if you try to connect points from the same location, then it's pointless. Mm -hmm. And the number one skill that I have, in my opinion, and that I've seen this, uh, I always do this in all of my businesses, is I make things exist. So from thoughts to tangible things, I'm obsessed of bringing that thought into something tangible. From the thought of having my own business, from the thought of having uh, this particular project from the thought of um, reaching this level um, or a new project that's never been sold, that's something that I'm actually obsessed with. Mm -hmm. I want to make things exist. That's exciting. I remember hearing from somebody that everything is that exists in this world was created twice, first in our brain and then making it exist in real life. So there we have it. Well, <clears throat> now it's time to share your worst investment ever. And since nobody ever goes into their worst investment thinking it will be, tell us a bit about the circumstances leading up to it and then tell us your story. Well, it's, um, it's not really a, I don't think it's an investment. It's sort of an investment. For my second business, we did a lot of events. Uh, these are big events. Um, High-level productions. Uh, we mostly did it for multinational companies, uh, fashion shows, launches, um, sales conferences. We were the ones who were organizing it. And the thing about doing events and having multinational clients is that they have terms, and th that's their leverage. Being a giant, and normally they would charge thirty to sixty. And I have actually for this particular client, I just remembered now it's ninety. 90 days from the time that you've built them. So it's basically three months. And this project was too big 
to, to pass and we were able to pitch and we were able to win it and we were barely a startup during that time and once we once we won the project we of course ju during that particular business of mine i was in charge of business development acquisition of clients and at the same time finance so when i finally got the cost estimate uh it was more than a hundred thousand dollars for us to mount that particular project and uh, we barely had five thousand dollars in the bank and i i remember um my previous business partner told me that she would be able to find a um, financer who can finance the event and I trusted her and uh, I told her, oh, you know what, I'm busy with this business dev thing and uh, making sure that I, our event would be profitable. And she said, okay, just leave it to me. And then so when we met this person, we were just a few weeks before the event and uh, that's when she dropped the, the message to us or the bomb, like, you know what, I can lend you $100,000, but that's 10% per month. Per month? Per month. Per month. Not per year. Not per year, thirty thousand dollars. So, yeah, and I, w and I was shocked. And there was only like two to three weeks left before the actual event. And of course, we had to pay suppliers. We had to, and uh, th this was our first big event. And I was, you know, I didn't know where to start. I didn't know. I try. Should I borrow money from my friends? Should I borrow? Uh, do I have any other choices for this one? And because of the lack of time for us, we grabbed it. And the reason why I grabbed it is, number one, we had no choice. We already signed the contract. The invitations were already sent out. Th these were like 800 people who would go to that event. And it's, uh, it's going to be held at in the, one of the most prestigious hotels and one of the biggest multinational brands. And I just wanted to save face, but at the same time, I tried to find some silver lining uh, with this one, even if I knew that this is gonna eat up our margins for this event. Normally big events would um, get at least a 30 to 40% margin. So if um, 100,000, we would earn at least $40,000 at most, mm. or if you're really good with numbers and your terms, you most likely you bump it up to 50%. Mm. But we were able to, um, I think, close to 35%. And um, yeah, so when we were able to successfully mount it, and I told to myself, well, now, basically, we did it to, to for this person. So we're going to give them um, our margins to this person who lent that money. Because this multinational, of course, they won't budge within 90 days. So, and the silver lining that I was talking about earlier was, if there's one silver lining that made me say yes to this agreement, not just because we lack time, is because even if we don't earn from this, the concept of loss leader, I told myself, well, I'll just call it, uh, uh, put this under the lesson of a loss leader, like mm. you're going to lose now, but you win in the long run because because of this event, we were able to use that as a springboard that we, sh if our clients would tell us, as I mentioned, I wanted to make something exist, right? Yeah. And uh, we were sort of a startup. And when people ask us, can you do this event? We'll just play this video and show it to the client. And they would say, wow, that's a great event. And number two, that's a big client. So even if we didn't earn back then, uh, it did wonders for the business. Th is it worth it? No, it's still not <laughs> worth it after this day. <laughs> so that, that idea that you had was just kind of a justification for what yeah. you did, but it didn't turn out that it, you could have still built your business without that yeah and um 
again, it's not worth it. It's uh, up to this day. If I look back into it, I was like, oh my god, that was the. It's like I worked for that person. Mm. Um, I can't believe that. Remember the time that I wrote the check. I. Uh, I just couldn't give it wholeheartedly. It, I resentfully gave it to that person. <laughs> And up to this day, I hope this person made good use of that money because it's just ridiculous. Yeah. Now, you can buy a car. You can, you can, can you imagine the, the, for a startup, that amount would definitely help the organization right away. Yeah. yeah. Um, it can provide you two to three months runway in terms of salaries. Yeah. Uh, but instead, it went to this person. Um, and when you did the event, did you know right from the time that you got that loan that this was just going to, suck up all the profit or was there a point in your mind you were thinking no 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 this could work but then when you ran the numbers later you realized how did how what how did that happen oh i knew from the get-go that's why throughout the event i was resentful i knew from the get-go i was resentful and i was i was already thinking of action points how to move forward i don't want it to mm. happen again and then i remember my partner before told me well we should be thankful for this person that this uh this person loaned us money. I was like, no, <laughs> it's kind of hard to be thankful if this is this is more than this beyond cutthroat. Mm, mm, um, mm. That's a loan shark if you think about it. Yeah. it. Even loan sharks have better terms compared to that person. And just be, again, I think we I felt that I we were taking advantage of because of the time. Yeah. And I know for a fact in myself that. Um, I could have gotten better mm. and the best part is you know the silver lining worked we got another project right with the same amount of money for us to mount but this time you know i knew better mm. and um, the rest is history so maybe you can summarize the lessons that you learned from this thinking about people out there that you know are facing a very similar situation um you know, when you start your business, you try to, one of the biggest challenges is finding that funding from the get go, right? Mm. So where do you find these funds? Uh, of course, banks, you know, in my first business, I tried to get a loan anchored on what? Nothing mm. dreams. And, um, I got shut down right away. And, um, the, you'll be surprised where you can actually find funds and for this second event that we did i tried to borrow from friends i borrowed for friends and i was surprised that they were initially i was i, d I didn't like or i didn't even borrow from my friends back then mm. because just the thought of me failing and losing their money, I can't bear that. Right. And uh, and I think that at the, at the same time, when you borrow from friends, all the stories that you hear that uh, your first customers are not even going to be your friends, but you're going to ra random strangers. Mm. But I tried anyway. So I started with my best friend and a, another close friend of mine. I was so nervous back then. And I remember I asked them 10% again, but this time six months. Mm. And uh, they agreed. And the best part is they even extended the term because we're friends. And I remember I was so, uh, the, the appreciation that I felt for my friends back then. I was like, wow. Mm. I, the thing that I was f fearing the most of me getting rejected uh, was not even there because they were all out support and that made me more appreciative of them and in a way motivated not to fail because you know what they also place their dreams on you yeah. because anytime that that money can just go up in the smoke up in, you know gone and hmm. um, I remember my business partner um, I just want to share the story as well um, for this particular project, I mentioned to my partner that I was able to grab this. 
just for reference, the reason why I closed my second business is because I uh, different vision, different perspectives with my partner back then. So I remember at this point, she was doing more on the execution. I was doing on the uh, business development and finance. <coughs> and the thing about business development, you don't see it tangible right away. With execution, it's easy because it's right in front of you. Yeah. And then I remember she, um, I told her, okay, for this next event, you borrow money from your friends. I borrow money from my friends, and let's see how much you can bring. I was able to borrow at least uh, $100,000 again, and she was able to borrow um, what's that, $500, the most. And it seemed like it was easy for her. Uh, it seems like borrowing money is easy. <coughs> and she brushed it off as something that's not very important for the business because she's all about execution. Mm. And I told her, you know what? I agree that execution is a lot, it's a big factor in the business, but I want you to understand that when you borrow money, it, it's more than the money. It, it's because this, I remember I told her, what's in line here is friendship. That's been built throughout the years and the trust that they were able to give to me mm. it says a yeah. lot about the person on how much I, I, this is what i believe in if you can borrow money from your friends and families or whoever it says a lot about you because that means in a way you're you're trustworthy it says even more when you can pay it back exactly <laughs> uh, i remember i paid it back um, my friend got a guitar um they were so happy. I was like, you know what? I'm going to use this money to pay for the things that I like. I was like, okay, do whatever you want. And my friend went abroad. And I was like, you know what? Go ahead. Go crazy. Enjoy. Um, well, maybe I'll share uh, my thoughts on, you know, what I, uh, what I heard from this. I, it reminds me of two stories that I had. Um, one of them was that when we started one of my businesses, Coffee Works, Coffee Factory, we struggled through the 1997 Asian financial crisis here in Bangkok and just barely alive, just barely alive. But we had this big factory and <clears throat> a very nice Singaporean man came into town and somehow we met him, came out to our factory and he says, I'm going to order X number of containers from your factory to ship to um, Eastern Europe. And we were so excited. And, you know, he said, it's got to be the low cost. I mean, it, we really, really competitive. So we did a bidding as low as we possibly could. And then it turns out that we didn't have the production capacity to meet his needs. So we had to start buying equipment and we didn't have the budget to buy, you know, the right kind of equipment. So we had to get kind of substandard grinders and substandard roasters. And we put out a lot of money to do that. <clears throat> and we got it going because we signed the agreement and we were going to fill you know, those containers and, and we needed this. This was our way out. And I can still remember in the factory, you know, it was like dust everywhere, people wearing face masks and stuff because we were just grinding coffee with these really industrial grinders. And uh, <clears throat> so we shipped out a few of those containers. And once we started making the calculations, we just realized it's a money loser for us. And we're not in a position where we can bear that for very long. And basically, I happened to be in Singapore for a meeting for something else. And I asked if I could come see the man that we signed the contract with. And I just said, look, we signed this contract with good intent. And we definitely want to. We needed this. But we can't do it at this level or else it's just going to kill us. And he and I discussed it. And we agreed to exit the contract. And we walked out of that. And it's just a lesson the lesson is that you can always go back and ask. You can always go back and try. You know, you may not get it, but you can try. And you can always say, well, I'm sorry, uh, I'm not going to kill my business over this contract for this huge company that had all kinds of business. That's the first lesson. The second one was uh, we had a big company in Thailand recently, not too long ago, wanted, to, wanted us to supply them. 
but their credit terms were like 90 days and we just didn't have the funding to do it because we shipped the equipment from Italy. It took a while to get here. We had letters of credit to some extent, but you know, it was just, we knew we would be financing these guys massively and they weren't going to order a tiny number. They were going to order like a thousand or 2000 coffee machines. And in the end, we basically went to them and said, we, the most that we can do is 30 days. And my business partner stuck with that. And we walked away from a huge deal that could have made us much bigger, or it could have been the weight that sunk our ship. And so I think when I listen to your story, it makes me realize, and I want listeners to think, you know, when you find yourself in a situation like that, you know, you can, you can either decide I'm going to deliver this no matter what, or you can decide I've got to go talk to them. The third choice is kind of run away, which some people do. And I don't think you need to do that. So those are some um, lessons I learned that you really reminded me of. And I appreciate that. Is there anything you would add to that? Oh, yeah. I asked the, the one who loaned us money. She, uh, she didn't bunch. <laughs> yeah. I, I tried. I was like, can, can we go lower than this? And nope. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's why, again, it's a, still a tough pill to swallow up to this day. And yeah. Well, someday she may come to you and ask to borrow some money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, All right. So, easy. I, yeah. I do, well, you know, it just, the world just goes round and round. We, we exactly. never know, right? Yep. So based upon what you learned from this story and what you continue to learn, what one action would you recommend our listeners take to avoid suffering the same fate? Well, know your numbers. Definitely. Mm. I'm very big on numbers, um, margins, um, runways, uh, but at the same time, think bigger. At the mm. same, or the second time that we did that event, we had better terms with our suppliers. Because we had better terms with our suppliers, um, that's another silver lining because the since it was our first big project, the suppliers, of course, you can't just simply ask for terms for a first project, mm. right? And then when they got paid, I had more leverage, so I asked better terms. So you have to understand when when money is involved, you ha really have to manage the cash flow. You really have to manage how long can you survive without a sale. Yeah. That's always been that's always in my head. Mm. Because uh, in my first business, I remember ha having three months runway for almost three years. And um, it made me anxious. Can you imagine? You deliver a service in 30 days, and then you collect after 30 days, which is normally 45 days. So, in, so all in all, you had 30 plus 45, that's 75, and you only have like 15 days left. <coughs> and... Um, that's a constant anxiety. And that's why right now when I create runways, if it's six months, it's, it's already like red for me. It, that, uh, that anxiety triggers. Mm. Uh, if it's one year, I'm, you know, I can rest for a bit. But normally, that's, uh, that's very important because that would give you peace of mind. And so you won't be able to make rash decisions such as what I did agreeing to a 10% interest per month yep great so it gives you more freedom if you're prepared uh, definitely you know your numbers that's good advice all right last question what's your number one goal for the next 12 months uh number one goal for the next 12 months well for my for one of the goals right now is um It's, it's pandemic right now. So executive search is one mm. of my business and events, which was severely affected. And the other one is live stream shopping. So in, in this pandemic, there are three statuses for companies, in my opinion. The first status is dying. The second one is surviving. And the last one is thriving. So in the next 12 months, uh, executive events and executive search is more on the spectrum of surviving. I know a lot of executive search firms who already closed shop because of the pandemic, because their clients stopped hiring. 
Mm. And uh, right now, even if the market is bouncing back, uh, it's still kind of a challenge because those who survive I, right now are fighting for whatever piece of meat is out there. So the competition is tougher compared to pre-pandemic. So I want to get that go beyond into the spectrum. I want to cross to the thriving side in the next right. one. Fantastic. And, and for the live stream shopping, um, as of what we know, we're currently leading in the country and we do want to keep that lead and really make it big and scale it to the point of um, it's crazy. So right now we just got another floor and we're still going to create more and more studios for that particular company. So mm. more of the thriving side in the next 12 months. Great. Well, we'll follow up in 12 months. <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> listeners, there you have it. Another story of loss to keep you winning. My number one goal for the next 12 months is to help you, my listener, reduce risk and increase return in your life. To achieve this, I've created our community at myworstinvestmentever.com. I look forward to seeing you all there. As we conclude, Pat, I want to thank you again for coming on the show. And on behalf of A. Stotts Academy, I hereby award you alumni status for turning your worst investment ever into your best teaching moment. Do you have any parting words for the audience? Um, just keep on keeping on. That's uh, and make things exist. You know, if you're going to be a business owner, that thought into tangible things, make things exist, and you know, ups and downs are normal. So just keep on keeping on. Right on. That's a wrap on another great story to help us create, grow, and protect our well, fellow risk takers. This is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stott, saying, "I'll see you." on the upside.